Hello there, my friend. It is I, Brother Joe Amato, once again, of Pour Out Your Spirit. Many have been prophesying that we are moving into a great revival. So today I have a message for you entitled, What is Hindering Your Revival? First, let's discuss what exactly revival is. According to GodQuestions.org, Revival refers to a spiritual reawakening from a state of dormancy or stagnation in the life of a believer. It encompasses the resurfacing of a love for God, an appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for His Word and His Church, a convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin, a spirit of humility, and a desire for repentance and growth in righteousness. Revival invigorates and sometimes deepening deepens rather the believer's faith, opening his or her eyes to the truth in a fresh new way. It generally involves the connotation of a fresh start with a clean state slate rather, marking a new beginning of a life lived in obedience to God. Revival breaks the charm and power of the world which blinds the eyes of men and generates both the will and power to live in a world but not of the world. Robert Coleman said that revival is the awakening or quickening of God's people to their true nature and purpose. Charles Finney, a revivalist, said that revival is the return of the church from her backslidings and the conversion of sinners. Richard Owen Roberts saw revival as an extraordinary movement of the Holy Spirit producing extraordinary results. Kathy Gray of the Cornfield Revival in Missouri stated to me what revival is is restoring God's people back to their God and back to the book of Acts. Yes, revival is all of those things and more beloved. In particular, it is a call to holiness, laying down a life of fleshly sin and walking instead in the Spirit. It is also walking in our individual and corporate callings. It is the return of the prodigals. It is the power of the Holy Spirit displayed in the spreading of the Gospel as we function in His gifts. And it is also returning to the book, a Book of Acts type Christianity that Christ intended for us to experience. The next question that we could, should consider is who is revival for? Revival is for the humble and the contrite. Contrite means being remorseful or penitent, sorry for your sins. Isaiah 57 15 says, <clears throat> for thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. <clears throat> I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. One of the best scriptures to kickstart revival is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 14. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. <clears throat> we are not humbled, beloved. We will not see revival. If you are not seeking God's face in prayer, you will not see revival. If you remain in your wicked ways, you will not see revival. Another important question is, where does revival come from? This may also be asked, what are the sources of revival? A source of revival is God's Word. According to Psalm 119 verse 25, the psalmist wrote, My soul clings to the dust, revive me according to your word. In Psalm 107, the psalmist wrote, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. And in Psalm uh, 119, verse 154, 
he asked, plead my cause and redeem me, revive me according to your word. Another source of revival is God's way. In Psalm 119 verse 37, the psalmist prayed, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Another source of revival is God's righteousness. In Psalm 119, verse 40, he wrote, Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. And Psalm 143, verse 11 says, Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. God's judgments are also a source of revival. In Psalm 119, verse 156, it is written, Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. The Lord's loving kindness is yet another source of revival. In Psalm 119, verse 159, the psalmist says, Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your righteousness. Now let's consider this question. What does the Lord revive us from? God's desire is to revive us from trouble, my friend. In Psalm 138, verses 7 and 8, David wrote, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 and on to 21, it says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. And he will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Yes, the Lord revives us in trouble. Even if we are like a bruised reed, He will not allow us to be broken. If we are a flax that is smoldering, with its last bit of life left in it, He will ignite us again with the fires of revival. He will send forth justice until we have full victory. Hallelujah. God will also revive us from despair. In Genesis chapter 45, verses 25 to 28, we hear of Jacob being told by his sons that Joseph, his son, whom he thought was dead for many years, was still alive and successful in Egypt. He didn't believe them at first. Verse 27 reads, But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. Joseph my son is alive. I will go and see him before I die. The Lord made all of Jacob's years of hopelessness and despair give way to new hope and joy, and he will do the same for you, beloved, if you are in despair. Psalm 71 verses 19 to 21 declares, Also your righteousness, O God, is very high. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. God also revives from death. In Isaiah 54, verses 16 and 17, the Lord said, Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon for that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises up against you in judgment you shall condemn. 
This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. This helps us to declare Psalm 118, verse 17, I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. Hallelujah. God's purpose for you is and will always be life, beloved. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes not ex does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. God also wants to revive us even from utter destruction. As the Lord taught Ezekiel in chapter 37, he can raise an army to life from only dry bones. Yes, our God can even revive us out of complete destruction. Joel chapter 2 verses 23 to 29 says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. For ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that had dwelt, that had dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and upon also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my Spirit. Even so, hallelujah, Lord, do it. Another thing that may be hindering your revival is the size of your God. How big or small do you perceive the Lord to be in relation to your need, in relation to your sin, in relation to any obstacle that is standing in your way, beloved? What is your current view of Jesus? In childhood, I was given an idol that represented Jesus as a child. It was called the Infant of Prague. Although it was dressed in royal garb, as a child who had not yet fulfilled his purpose, that icon was lacking, mainly, of course, because it was not the true Jesus. The crucifix in the Catholic Church that I had once looked to still had the body of Jesus on it. That representation of Christ had not yet completed his mission. He had not yet set the captives free from Satan's grip in hell. He was not yet glorified. This is why it's better not to have any carved images as a reminder of the unseen God that we worship. These limit how awesome God truly is. This is one of the Lord's Ten Commandments given to Moses, found in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. God said, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any, li any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. How big is your God, beloved? If he is your size, in your mind, can he really handle the problems that are bigger than you? Can he empower you to fight your giants? Or do you feel like grasshoppers in their midst? Therefore the psalmist teaches us to magnify the Lord. Make God big in your own mind, just as he is huge in reality already, and powerful, all-powerful. But he rewards us according to the faith that we placed in him. A small God is inadequate. 
a big God is all powerful. Psalm chapter 34 verses 3 through 10 encourages us, O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you saints. There is no want to those who fear him. A young lions lack, the young lions lack and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. What is God's size in reality? In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1, the beginning part of that verse, the Lord declares, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22 tells us that the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. That is an awesome God, beloved. The Jesus we worship and serve today is no longer a babe in a manger. He's not a carpenter in Nazareth anymore. He's no longer a suffering lamb of sacrifice. He is glorified. He is lifted high. He is the victor. He is the custodian of the keys of hell and death. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. His shed blood testifies that we belong to him as he advocates for us at God's right hand, even in our weaknesses. This is the Jesus who we must approach. It is he with whom we have to do. Hallelujah. In John chapter 14, verses uh, 12 through 14, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Beloved, that is the stuff of the book of Acts. This is the revival that I see on the nearest horizon. Can you see it with the eyes of faith, beloved? Hallelujah. Finally, here are possible hindrances to your revival. Some of them are not so much hindrances as they are reasons you've waited for your revival. Number one, you may be waiting for God's time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 says to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. When the Lord uh, brings us a season of revival, then it will come. Amen. God determines times and seasons. Number two, suffering and hardship has caused you to identify with Jesus, your Lord and Savior. The season before revival is often hard and dry, like those dry bones in Ezekiel. The Lord uses us, uh, uses rather those times in the valley for us as much as those times when we are dancing on our mountaintops. We identify more with Jesus when we are identifying with his sufferings. According to Galatians chapter 5 verses 24 and 25, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. Number three, we've had those dry and hard and painful pre-revival times to understand what others are going through so that we could minister to them when revival comes. For the souls that are coming to Christ, the things that they have gone through and we've gone through as well, we've come through with the testimony of God's faithfulness, of God's power to heal, of God's power to change our lives, of, of the wonderful works of God wrought in us and for us through, through our experiences with Him. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, 
4 wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. That is sometimes why we suffer, beloved, so that we can have a testimony of God bringing us through those times so others can be brought through through our witness and our testimony. Praise the Lord. Number four, unconfessed sin and lack of holiness can hinder revival. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 23, we're instructed to therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot for indeed he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren love one another fervently with a pure heart having been born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever hallelujah some powerful truths in that scripture take a little time beloved to go back over it if you'd like again that is 1 Peter 1 13 to 23 we have to be holy as he is holy. Hallelujah. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-10, through 10, it helps remind us that when we do stub, stu, uh, stumble, rather, <laughs> as I stumble with my words, as we, when we do stumble, stumble in sin, because we are not perfect, perfect as you can clearly see, as I'm getting all tongue-tied, we ought to confess it and move on with the Lord and his plans for us. The scripture reads, This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. How much sin? Some of it? Half of it? A little bit of it? The scripture says His blood cleanses us from all sin, beloved. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive, deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess, and I put that but there, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say we haven't sinned, we make make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That's very important, beloved. It's something that I've learned in my life. Sometimes the Lord will use me most after I've fallen. The thing is, you have to pick yourself up and 
by the power of his shed blood and you have to go back to the Lord you have to humble yourself beloved and say Lord I've done it again I've I've offended you by sinning in this way please forgive me and heal me I thank you for the blood of Jesus that you cleanse me from all sin and we move on in him but our focus and our goal should be holy living as much as is possible and in time through the power of the Holy Spirit he gives us the ability to do so thank you Lord number five believing a lie is another hindrance to revival all right what do I mean by that beloved Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ there are people that are living in in a sense alternate realities their view of life is twisted based on sin or based on the traditions of men or based on some other lie or evil concept that they are going by but our lives should be fashioned and formed by the power of the Holy Spirit under the tutelage of the Word of God, the living Word of God, the Holy Bible. So there are many lies that people live in, beloved, and we have to have the truth and be in the truth of God's Word to enjoy the Lord's revival. Jesus often said to Satan, even when he saw him working through people, get thee behind me, Satan. It's a common phrase you've read in Scripture. Jesus was putting behind him the devil and the devil's lying words so that he can move on with God's plans and purposes for his life. We should learn how to recognize Satan when he comes to us, the father of lies, in whatever form he takes and leave him behind us and leave those lying words behind us so that he will not hinder what God is by his Holy Spirit is doing in and through us, beloved. Also, our you too taught to hear good instruction and receive truth when you hear it. In the movie Waterboy, the simple-minded Bobby Boucher believed all the countless lies told by his fearful controlling mother, which created a whole false reality for him that almost kept him back from a life of success. He told his teacher once, my mama says that alligators are ornery because they got all them teeth and no toothbrush. Are you in bondage, beloved, under the weight of Satan's lies that has twisted reality for you? There is no antidote for this, my beloved, like the Holy Bible, to help you see things as they truly are. Think about the life that we're living, beloved. Is it lined up with the reality of God's Word? Or are you walking contrary to God's word? In scripture the Lord said in the Old Testament that we are he is laying before us life and death. There is a choice always, beloved. And he says, and he says it's almost like he's saying, I'll give you a hint. He says, and choose life. He's telling you what you should do. And if we're obedient to the Lord, beloved, then we will choose life and we will live. We will live our life according to his laws and his precepts and God's goals for us so it's very important beloved especially in revival number six a lack of faith can certainly hinder revival when we talk about faith one of the very most basic scriptures Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 which says but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So if you believe that, you are aligning your life with a focus. I know that you are there, God, and I know that you will honor me when I come in prayer, seeking your face for wisdom, for direction, for guidance, and obedience. Also, you must trust that God is no respecter of persons, as it says in Acts 10, 34. In that context, it's referring to the fact that God will save a Jew or a Gentile. But I believe we can also take that a little further to mean 
that all of the great things that God has done for others, He'll do for you. So when I approach God, if I need healing for something in particular, I think of others I've heard that have been healed of those same things. And I can reach out to the Lord and say, But Lord, I trust that you, you don't show partiality. You're not a respecter of persons. You healed this one of that ailment. So I'm trusting you that you're going to heal me as well. Amen. Also, we must put out the voices of doubt and fear. When we are standing on God's word and his promises in faith, we must put out all of the lying voices of Satan that come in to bring fear, that come in to try to steal the blessing that God has for us. Jesus did this in Luke chapter 8, verses 49 to 56. The account begins, While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Now this happened, uh, this was uh, Jairus who came to ask for the Lord to heal, Jesus to heal his daughter who was lying sick in bed. And what uh, delayed Jesus' coming was the woman with the issue of blood had touched the hem of his garment and that whole situation happened. When that had ended, this is when this part of the story occurs. So this person came and said to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in, except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside. He took her by the hand and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Think of that story, my friend, how he needed to put out all the voices of doubt and fear, all the lying voices of the enemy, he could not perceive that he who was going to raise to life from the dead after being crucified, being laid in the tomb for three days, going to the bowels of hell and taking captivity captive from Satan, they could not acknowledge that the Lord's Messiah had the ability to conquer death. But he knew who he was, beloved, and we know who we have. We have that same God. The Bible says that the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. That same power lives in us. So don't you think we're going to see miracles like that, beloved, in these last days, where God may very well use you or me to speak a word over a corpse and see them rise? I know some of you think that's fantastical, but that's scripture. I'm going to tell you, I might shock some of you, but Peter and Paul didn't walk around with halos on their head. They walked around like you and me. But they believed in the God in whom they served. They believed in two things. In his ability to do miracles. And they believed in his willingness to do them. And if we believe that, beloved, and if we're open to the moving of his Holy Spirit, God will use you and I do powerful things. Amen. Amen. You see, fear and doubt come in to try to steal God's blessings like revival. So what do we do? Put them out. Put them out. In Jesus' name, put them out. Also, familiar, familiarity can hinder faith and revival. Do you believe that God can use you such as you are? that he can use a believer in whom you've seen failure in the past? I do. Right? But even though Jesus never sinned, he still couldn't do a lot of miracles when he visited his own hometown. Just because the townspeople were too familiar with him having grown up there, 
remembering him as a child, remembering his family, knowing some of the members of his family. You can read the whole account about this in Mark chapter 1, chapter 6, rather, verses 1 through 6. But let's listen to the last part of that account, verses 4 through 6. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. All right, so think about that. From the place where he came from, couldn't really affect it. It makes you wonder why sometimes, makes you rather understand why sometimes the Lord might take someone out of a locale that they're familiar with and move them to another place because then they're not in their own hometown and people don't know their backstory perhaps okay but it's pretty powerful stuff when you think about it what I want to focus on in verse 5 it talks about that he did lay hands and a few sick people were healed so I want to be those people I want to believe that maybe a family member or a friend that's in the Lord that maybe they have things in their past that weren't in line with the Word of God and weren't in line with God's will for their life, but God can change a life so that He can use any of us. So I want to be like one of those people that were healed by Jesus, even though they recognized Him. And even though maybe they had coffee once or twice a week with His mother. Right? Praise the Lord. The last thing that I want to point out about faith is the declaration of three Hebrew boys. You know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were put in the fiery furnace and when they were put inside Jesus was in the middle with them. They came out not burnt at all, not even a singe, completely whole and their clothing didn't even smell of smoke. But this is the beginning of that story. King Nebuchadnezzar threatened them. Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, sultry, in uh, symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? So that was the king's threat. Here, the, here is their answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. And that's found in Daniel chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. That's the kind of faith that I believe best honors God, my friend. That's the kind of faith that positions you for revival. Lord, I know that you are able to move mightily, and I know that you desire to move mightily. But even if I am destroyed, I have an eternal home in heaven with you. And I am still victorious, and I win in the end. You win, beloved, no matter what. Why not believe then? Why not believe in God's ability and in God's willingness to do mightily in these dark times? Hallelujah. Finally, we are told, quench not the spirit. Revival will truly be hindered if we do that, my friend. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16-22 through 22 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. A revival, beloved, is a move of God's Holy Spirit. Therefore, 
he should definitely not be quenched. He should flow like a mighty river, or burn like a raging fire. I hope you haven't become too comfortable with him as your quiet comforter, occupying a tiny corner of your heart and life, while forgetting that he is the very power, as I said earlier, that raised Christ up to life from death. He must increase. You and I must decrease. Let's pray, beloved. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Father God, we worship you and we magnify your name. You're worthy of praise. You're worthy of glory. You're worthy of honor and adoration, Lord. There is none like you. Father God, if I search for all of eternity, never will I find another like you. Hallelujah. Revival, Lord, is for the humble and the contrite. Therefore, Lord, let us have that mind and that heart, Lord. Send us revival, Lord, according to your word, your way, your righteousness, your judgments, and your loving kindness, Father. Lord, revive us from trouble, from despair, from death, and even from destruction, O God. For you, Lord, can make even the dry bones live again. Hallelujah. Father, you are almighty, all-powerful. You are great and greatly to be praised. For nothing is impossible to you. And with you, there is no lack, Father. Hallelujah. We acknowledge that you are bringing us, Lord, now into a season of revival. We thank you for all that we have gone through, Lord, that you have used many things, both what we would perceive as good and as bad, as hard and as blessings, Father God, to prepare us for it. Father, through difficulty, suffering, and hardship, we identify more with your Holy Son, Jesus. And therefore, at the end, it is a good thing. Father God, we thank you for the testimonies which we have now to encourage the many souls that will be coming into your kingdom in the coming days, Lord. Free us from every lie of the enemy, Lord, especially those that have altered our reality and that have held back our destinies, Lord. Help us to walk by faith in the Spirit and not by sight, May we never quench your precious Holy Spirit, but rather fan his flame, flame, Lord. Oh, Father, let his river flow freely, Father. Yes, we do indeed thank you for coming revival, Lord. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, all the more, and our lives for it. Thank you for calling us to holiness. Father, we cannot do it of our own accord. We need the precious blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all sin, O oh God. Help us to lay down the burden of sin under the cross of Christ, Lord. Jesus, wash away all of our sin under the precious flow of your blood. I confess with my mouth that you, Jesus, are my Lord and Savior. Your sacrifice atoned perfectly for my sins, and you've set my relationship with God, my Heavenly Father, right. I believe that he raised you back to life in power on the third day. Thank you for moving me into my calling. Thank you for calling home your prodigals and new believers to come into your kingdom too. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to enable us to spread the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, that we might produce the fruits of your precious Holy Spirit and function in his gifts according to your will. Help us to return to ministry, true ministry with power as it was when the book of Acts was written, Lord. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, my friend. Our almighty God loves you, as do I. Let us lift our hands heavenward, and let us pray. Lord, pour out your Spirit, and send us a great revival. Revive us, O Lord. Hallelujah. Please like, subscribe, and share this channel, and may God richly bless you, my beloved. Until next time, bye-bye.